Welcome to the In Story Show. I'm Devorah Spillman, your host. And this season, we are focusing on empaths. And today, I am thrilled to welcome Jennifer Arizio. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you. My pleasure. So before we jump in, I'm going to read just a little bit about you, and then we'll dive in. Jennifer Arizio is the founder of Soul Language, a paradigm that puts tangibility to soul. So a conscious connection can be established to enable crystal clear decisions for success. Jennifer is also a master intuitive and author of two best-selling books. Currently, she has trained over 20 practitioners worldwide in soul language. At this time, there are over 5,000 individuals all over the world connecting to their soul language. I love that so much. I'm always talking about if you find your soul story, it will reveal your purpose. And so <laughs> speak in my language. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so Jennifer, you know, I know that for a lot, for almost all of us, b- teaching people their soul language was probably not the work you did at the beginning of your career. And <laughs> And, uh, and I'm assuming you can see, think of yourself now as an empath and highly sensitive. And I'm curious for you to talk about what it was like for you when you were growing up. Because I, for most of us, that was not our strength at that time. Or not, it wasn't valued by the culture, generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it was valued by the culture. I don't think the culture was really aware of it, right? Right. You know, and so there was no structure for even to talk about the value of it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I grew up like, you know, a suburban family, you know, parents divorced, kind of a normal childhood, no big, huge drama. Um, and I, I think my kind of realization of my empathic abilities really hit in my 20s and in my 30s about like, what, what's going on? I mean, I would go into a casino and I would wind up do, like working on four different slot machines all at the same time because I was soaking up all of that kind of addictive behavior and I just could not stop. So it was like hand over fist. Like I went to Puerto Rico one vacation and I was in the casino and my friends were at the beach, right? So I didn't really understand what that was until I started understanding my intuitive gifts, understanding the way my soul spoke to me. And I heard about like empathic and what's that about. And, and I finally was like, oh, okay. So that's why I can like tell when I go into a room who's sleeping with who and who likes who and who doesn't. And, you know, know, like the entire energy of everyone in the room. Now I have words for it. And once you have words for something, you can really put some consciousness and some intention behind it. And so I started taking, you know, master intuitive classes and studying with some, you know, world renowned kind of psychics and putting words to it. And then from there, that gave me the ability to start tapping in deeply into my soul and asking the questions that I wanted to ask. And that really defined and explained my own soulful gifts. And that's how soul language was born. So... So wait, I'm curious just to go back a little bit, because I'm curious what it was like when, when you were a kid. Like, did you notice, because I, I love to hear people's stories about how they were, as like, did you, did, but even if you didn't have words for it, did you find you knew things, you saw things, you understood things when you were a kid? Yeah, I mean, I, I always put it in, I knew things that people didn't. Like I knew why the parents were acting and the adults were acting the way they were um, and what they were saying all between the lines of what they were really saying. I think one of the hardest, hardest things that I had to deal with as a kid is like, wait, 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 do you guys not understand what's going on? Like, how come you guys are acting like this? That's kind of crazy. Like, do you not know what everyone's trying to say to each other? Um, which still drives me crazy, right? <laughs> but it's a different thing. And understanding that, you know, when my father walked into the house and I knew my great grandmother died, you know, I think I just knew. I think I had some awareness um, because I loved kind of understanding magic and occult stuff and, and really diving in deep. So I had some words to put what those kind of 
sensations were about. I just didn't have the conscious language to put behind it or how to utilize it in my greatest good and really how to hone that gift. So new things and yet things popped in my head and I was a real introverted kid. I was the kid that would go to a family gathering with a book. I would still go to a family gathering with a book if I could make that work. You know, so I just naturally thought that it was observation skills, but the growing, you know, and learning more, I finally realized like, wait, not everyone knows how to do that. But the funny thing is, is, you know, now that I know so much, I can also see the lineage, right? I can see how my grandmother can do it. I can see how my nephew can do it. Um, and so really not only understanding now how it's kind of passed on, but also understanding how to foster it in my nephew mm. by going, tell me, what'd you notice? What'd you see? You know, and even when he was a peanut communicating with him, you know, via like my mind, like, don't do it. And him responding just through energetics. I mean, that was huge. And I think that came with training. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, the title of the series is how empaths do it. And so I want you to talk about that now. Like, what are some of those skills? How do empaths do it, meaning do life? And what, what, what are you helping him with? And what, what did you, you know, because we didn't get help. Yeah, I think the, the most important thing um, is to understand what's yours and what someone else's. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. your thoughts, what your emotions are, and what someone else's. And to understand you know, as you grow older, when, it, when it's your role to offer and when it's your role not just to know and let everything go. I think, especially for, for new empaths, meaning new that are exploring their gifts and talents, there's this kind of desire to share, 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 and they kind of don't really fully understand that you need permission to share with what you're noticing or what, what you're intuitively getting. And so I started to understand, okay, this is mine and this is theirs. And, and it was a very simple way of doing it. And I still do it today. So I, you know, I go, okay, so what am I feeling? And then I put my hands over my shoulder into my left shoulder. And I go, what am I feeling now? And it started to teach me the separation of what was mine and what was someone else's. I also think empaths spend a lot of useless time trying to determine whose is what and where's it coming from. Mm -hmm. And unless you are conducting healing sessions with someone, I think that's a waste of your energy because your awareness is to understand it, understand what's yours, understand what direction, understand what information you get to process, but you can't do anything with anyone else's energy or stuff unless you're in that healing environment mm -hmm. and so that simple exercise really understands okay i'm happy oh wait i'm sad okay so if i'm sad then when i'm you know open and wide that means that it must be someone else's okay so i'm just going to lovingly send it back to them i don't even have to know whose it is mm -hmm. and i think that starts the kind of understanding of your own foundation i think it's really important to understand how your energy works and what your energy is doing. Mm -hmm. And so I started there. And then I started, you know, simply going, is this mine? Okay, it is. How do I process it? What is it trying, this information trying to share with me? Is this not okay? Do I need to be concerned about what I'm understanding? In other words, am I understanding something that is for my own knowledge, for my own safety, for my own experience? right? We've all been in a room where someone is very perky energy, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do it? How do you interpret that? You know, I would be asking, okay, is it in my greatest good to keep interacting with that energy? And I would get a yes or no. Sometimes there was a yes. And I'm like, why? And that would take a whole nother series of journey, right? But, you know, it's really asking questions. I think that's key to mm -hmm. improving your empathic abilities is to Tune in and ask questions of yourself. This is not something outside of you. It's not something foreign, meaning the skill. You know, you're a giant um, tuning fork. So you have to understand what notes you're reading 
and what notes yours are to keep and continue singing and what notes you get to toss back into the universe and allow those individuals to deal with that energy. So how, so keep, kind of keep moving us in this direction about how, you know, we're, one of the discussions is how people can turn these sensitivities into their strengths. Because when they're not understood and not supported, they feel like liabilities. Yeah. Well, first of all, you want to watch your language, okay? I'm starting to roll my eyes at highly sensitive, empathic. I'm like, okay, so what are we saying? Meaning, I think sometimes people use it as a crutch not to participate or engage in life. I think some people use it as a crutch of, of overwhelm. So I want you to really understand how you feel about that kind of skill. And simply shifting that, okay, I am willing and able to see how this could be my greatest gift. You are going to start to receive more information than, oh my God, I'm so sensitive. I'm in such overwhelm. Um, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm highly intuitive and I'm an introvert. So, you know, my, one of my friends would joke, we would go out and be like, oh, it's 59 minutes, Jennifer's Jen going to go home. Because after an hour, I was done. And I would judge myself so often. And I realized, like, I'm good. Like, you have to move from judgment to a deep understanding of yourself mm -hmm. and a deep love. I think when we are in full acceptance, everything becomes a gift rather than a challenge. And there's no quick fix. My gifts are, are my, the way of my, you know, being empathic is going to be different than someone else's. And I think that's really important to find out your personal formula. Mm -hmm. Tools are great. You know, if you have to go into a highly energized environment, I always tell people, do the Glenda the Good Witch bubble. We all know Glenda the Good Witch from Wizard of Oz. That beautiful pink bubble, enclose your whole body in that pink bubble. And that doesn't turn off your empathic abilities, but what that does is you don't ingest them. You know, and I think so often empaths ingest people's emotions because it's filling a need. Mm. They want to be of service or they don't feel worthy enough to stand in their own power. You also want to kind of be in the area of discuss, discovery investigation about those things, right? Mm -hmm. When we are, are highly conscious and when we are aligned, which I'm going to teach you how to do in a second, then what happens to your empathic abilities for me, it's a knowing but not I don't ingest it as a feeling. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. <clears throat> if you've been empathic, empathic for years and you're doing your healing modalities, you still have to keep cleaning your energy. You still have to keep updating your protocols. I think we can get really lazy. So do you want to play with me for a second? Of course. <laughs> okay. So when our central energetic channel, which is in alignment with the chakras, which goes from your head to your tailbone, is straight like a piece of uncooked spaghetti not brittle just straight that means we are aligned and when we are aligned we're in the consciousness of love and that also allows us to notice what's ours and what's theirs it also allows us not to ingest somebody's emotions and, and the reason why we ingest them also is because we in some way resonate with that emotion so whether it's happy or not enough in some part of us, we agree with that. So we don't really realize it's not ours. So here's the meditation. Just two seconds. You can close your eyes. Divine intelligence. Align my earth star and my heaven star. Align my soul. So it's for my life purpose and my life purpose alone. Align my soul so it's grounded fully in my body. Align my central energetic channel. So it supports my life purpose and my life purpose alone. And keep this alignment through this day. And I would love to know what you noticed. I felt um, just this incredible like shift to stillness, right? You know, like all the, even though I'm, you know, hosting and leading an interview and all that, but all of the extra went away. And I just felt this. Exactly. Welcome to you. Right? Welcome 
happen, and I think we're feeling stuff all the time that we don't even notice it, right? The very first time I kind of did that meditation, um, my whole energetic body went, and I went, oh, what was that? Why I was out so far out of alignment from taking on people's stuff that it literally just moved. There was not enough room for me and everyone else's stuff, right? So when it moved, it clicked back into place. People can do that anytime, any place. And that's going to allow you to be grounded and conscious and still and making choices based on knowing that you're whole and complete versus something else. Yeah. And I think so often when we're empathic, we don't really know if we're conscious, why are the choices coming? Yeah. I always tell clients, are you making choice from your soul, from pattern? or something else. And when you have to make a major choice, and as you do it with major choices, then you start to do it in a grand scheme, you know, grand thing you do with every choice. When you continue to ask those questions, you'll notice, oh wait, I just made that choice through pattern, right? Uh, you know, I was telling you, know, you how I, I think I have a broken toe, right? I was totally making that choice through pattern today. I was like, I got an hour, I'm going to run, I'm going to do the laundry, I'm going to do that, like, really? No, if I would have just sat down and went, isn't it the greatest good to do the laundry right now? I would have gotten a no. <laughs> and, 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 and it's laughable, but it's so true. And I have so many experiences where I'm not grounded in that knowing, and I bypass some intuitive moment. I bypass right. a knowing. My, the perfect example is my wallet. I was at an airport and my wallet is blinking at me on the counter. And I'm like, look, you know, I don't have time to listen to you right now. I got to go through, you know, the, the radar detector. I got to get to my seat, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't have time. I go through the radar. I go through this, you know, I'm almost at the gate. I see this bottle of water and it's blinking. I was like, I've got water. Why are you blinking at me? And it's blinking. I was like, fine. And I go to get my wallet. It's back on the counter right so luckily they were like and here's the really funny part so i go back and the woman's like we've been paging you have you not heard and i was like no like no she's like we've been paging you for like 20 minutes it shows you just how much i needed to kind of know and experience that lesson for myself rather than you know hearing the voice of god over the page sister right and i think there's so many times that we're so consumed by our own worries, our own concerns, and mass consciousness mm -hmm. that we're not actually allowing us ourselves to be still and yeah. really take action from our greatest good and from that place of deep connection. And I think that's key for impasse. Connection, connection, connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I've heard it in many other of the interviews that I am doing is that sense of, of awareness, that expanded awareness and that it, it, and I talk about how you have to get off the automatic, like you're, you were just in this automatic and you can't hear, you can't feel, you're completely unaware of what's outside, you know. So that's, I think, part of this the tools we're learning is to catch ourselves before we stub our toes, before we forget our wallets. But those, but, but here's the flip side. What happens as we're on this path is when those little things happen, we do learn from them. Oh, like, yeah. We do learn as opposed to saying, darn, and you're just off to the next thing. I, I'm sure you're the same. Like, okay, I'm li okay, fine. I'm listening. I'm right? listening. And, and you know, I always joke. I'm like, okay. I don't need it again. I got it. You know, I heard it. I understand. And, you know, and it's just me tripping up me literally. Right. And it's literally, and I'm using it right. I literally tripped over myself. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and it all happens in slow motion. Right. So you're like, Oh, right. And you fall into the wall and like, you know, it felt like I was being picked up and positioned. Right. So I didn't like hurt my hand. And I was like, okay, like, you know, it's, <laughs> And it's my left foot, you know, I get it. Like, I get all of the reasons. <laughs> and I think that's why, you know, on the path, sacred practice is so key. Right. Because it's that time where we tune in, we nurture our relationship with ourselves and the divine 
we profoundly listen, we ask those questions, so we don't have to trip ourselves up as much to get our attention. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's true that having some kind of sacred practice, I'll say inner practice, something that is that is a decision to be off of automatic, that is raising your consciousness, your awareness, all of that allows you to catch yourself sometimes and allows you to learn from the lessons so maybe we don't have to learn them the same way over and over. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't have to break a total in a lesson. I mean, lessons don't have to be full of struggle. And I think that is also something that people need to understand is like if you're empathic, it's a gift. And the moment you decide it's a gift, you're gonna shift your energy entirely. Mm-hmm. And tools are just gonna fall in your lap. I mean, obviously people have shifted something because they're watching us, right? So, you know, it's it's just when you're in that consciousness of discovery and knowing that you're whole and complete, you will get resources left and right. And it's a practice. Right. It is. And that, you know, it's one of the starting points is to um, choose a couple of practices that work for you. Yeah. Please don't try to do every practice that you want Stick with one for a couple weeks, let it integrate, let it be embodied, you know, let yourself practice it. Don't do one and go, oh, it didn't work and try another one. Like give yourself a break for that to kind of build up and for you to kind of shift. Sometimes it takes a little time for your energy energy to shift. And, you know, if, you know, especially if you're around family members, if you live with family members, right? And you want to shift your energy, it's going to take a little time because, you know, you're constantly within their own, that energy. And so you need to be really loving with yourself Mm -hmm. and, uh, and let the judgment go. Yeah. So that letting the judgment go is such a big, such an important work. Um, You know, I have a motto in my group that I call gently, gently, but relentlessly. And part of the reason I say that, like I know somebody else, their whole motto is we do hard stuff. And for my crowd, it, that works for many people. I get that. It's fine. But it doesn't work for the empath, for the highly sensitive, for the intro. It doesn't work for us because then we're just harder on ourselves. I mean, I'm a warrior and I do the hard stuff, but I mean, I just, it's more easy when we're, when I do the hard stuff gracefully, right? Right. You know, it's, it's a total different energy and, right. you know, it allows for so many resources from the universe. So, and I learned that the hard way. And then I crashed from cars and, you know, doing things worse than breaking a toe. Right. And so uh, what I love about all of this knowledge that's uh, out there now is this wasn't there, right. I had to go to the library and I had to, you know, find this person and, and I was given all of the blocks. But I think transformation is speeded up now because the blocks are just so readily, you know, we've got Google, right? So, you know, allow yourself the time just because we live in an instant world to practice some of these techniques and really utilize them and see how they impact you. And then after two weeks or three weeks, if you're not getting the shift, try another one. Right. That, that, you know, it doesn't matter which inner practice you do, whether it's writing or walking or sitting or whatever it is, but a big part of it is that awareness that you're off of automatic and that you are putting your conscious attention either into feeling your body or being expanded in higher connection, like something in that realm. Yeah. So since you're so connected with the soul and the language of the soul, why don't you talk a little bit about this connection between being an empath and the language of the soul and all of that? Yeah, I, you know, I, human beings love words for things. And, you know, as I was understanding my own gifts and talents, and, and I always knew this as a kid, I knew that there was something big inside of me. I just didn't know how to express it, right? So I thought, oh, art. So I went to photography school and then I liked to eat. So then I went into corporate America and then <clears throat> I thought it was, oh, publicity. You know, I'm so good at that. This is my expression. <laughs> I laugh at that now, right? And so what soul language does is it puts tangible tangibility to the soul. It puts words to what you know deep down inside. 
we each have three core energies of soul, your mission, how you feel about the mission, and then your soulful personality. And so I can give a one-liner not to put anybody in a box, but as a stepping stone to creating this conscious connection with structure for your soul so you can gain clarity. You know, we're all hearing our soul all the time, but when you create a conscious connection via your soul language team, it allows you to get clear insight. It allows you also to shift very quickly. Um, it's like liquid nitrogen for the soul. <clears throat> Wait, say it again, say that again. What's like liquid nitrogen for the soul? soul language is like li oh. liquid nitrogen for the soul. So what is soul language? It's three core energies of soul, your mission, how you feel that mission, and then your soulful personality. And so my one-liner based on my soul languages, which is defining my core energy, is I create balance for myself and others through love, integrity, and courage. And that becomes my mild marker for myself. If I'm not being and doing that, I'm going to create some suffering in my life. And so when people understand their soul languages, they understand how to move from, con from unconscious, which is struggle or pattern, to consciousness, which is operating through soul and power. It's, you know, I love it so much. I just did a teaching this morning from a Jewish book I have about what he calls the garments of the soul, that the soul is like the core energy of the soul, but it's, it, there's all these languages, like I love that you talk about soul language, and so it says that the garments, which is a great metaphor of the soul, are um, thought, speech, and deed, and so the whole idea that you can talk about it and think about it, like I talk about your soul story, and what is that and how do you access it? And I, I think what's happening now is we're really helping each other gain access to this other realm, yeah. these other ways of knowing. And they are so crucial. It's like we're starving. Often I feel like our souls are starving and they need to be fed this other, this higher consciousness, awareness, practices, like you said, sacred practice. And, you know, and I think as empaths and, um, highly sensitive people and so forth creatives we have th this that's how we're turning these sensitivities into our strengths and i think it's being asked of us like energetically asked of us yeah i wouldn't say the soul is starving because it's whole and complete i would say that the human yeah. is finally willing or able or asking to hear soul clearly right right it was exactly. kind of the energetics right of evolution of you know, first there was religion about defining what God was and, and, and what the, that could be for us and, and our place with God. And, and now the next level of consciousness is really defining how we are God and putting words around that and how we tune into that and how we create a relationship with that. And, you know, how do we be more of the individualization of the one here? And we need different words for it so different people can resonate and understand it on different levels and i think it's a very exciting time it is it is i, I feel like a lot of people feel like they're being called to more and there's an opening and an acceptance now for a lot of the gifts that a lot of people had naturally and shut them down yeah i think you know being highly intuitive is is not weird anymore you know mm -hmm. Um, it's not like, you know, cross my palm with silver, silver psychic. It's not really woo woo. I mean, I would never consider myself woo woo. And I talk about soul all the time, right? But I'm really grounded in it. So I think that's the level, next wave of consciousness. It's, it's moving from talking about angels and guides and teachers and all those things are great to moving into how do you connect with this deep part of you? How do you connect with your essential nature? And why is it in your greatest good for you to do so? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm so with you on this. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about the free gift that you've designed that really kind of brings these things together. Yeah, well, I designed it especially for you guys, which is- I know, it's so great. <laughs> so um, it's all around checking your emotion. There are two really tangible tools, down and dirty tools, to understand what's yours and what someone else is and really understand where you are emotionally, what's going on, because your emotion is, is more information. But if you're reading everyone's emotions or you're ingesting everyone else's energy, you have no idea what's yours and what someone else's is. So it's a real down and dirty, quick tool to understand what's yours and what's theirs. And then there's another part of it that's a grounding exercise. 
I think a lot of you know, very highly sensitive people in past spend a lot of time ungrounded. And it's hard to manifest if you're not grounded earth and sky. Yeah. So it's really about grounding yourself. I think we, we've separated or we keep our, ourselves ungrounded because it's been safer than feeling everything. So the combination of those two tools will allow any empath to move from overwhelm into understanding, wow, this is a gift, and then understanding how you may want to use it. I, I love that. I, I'm really so thankful and thrilled that you did that because part of my goal is twofold. One, to get people to tell their story and to hear each other's stories, and the other is to then start to begin to get tools so that you can actually, as I say, turn your sensitives into your strengths. And, you know, the focus is the whole thing about how do empaths do it? Like how do, the title, how do empaths do it? And part of it is we're sharing how do we do it? Like how do we do our lives? How do we turn this into our strengths? And part of that are telling our stories and then part of it is really new skills, new um, practices that we need in order to feel great and actually not shut those gifts down, but actually expand them. Yeah, if you shut the gifts down, you're gonna have to open them eventually. Um, it just, it, it's like putting a, you know, your finger in the dike. It's, it's just going to keep bubbling up. And so, you know, instead of shutting down, if you just go, okay, you know, fill yourself with ground and center yourself, fill yourself with peace, you know, ask if it's yours. That's just a huge step mm -hmm. that you can feel some sense of peace without overwhelm. And then you can make a better choice for yourself. 100%. Super, super powerful. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. Why don't you leave us with one last thought as we just as we go to wrap up? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that the reason why impasse are an overwhelm most of the time is they don't believe that they're worthy. Mm -hmm. So if you activate worthiness, that will definitely shift you from overwhelm to understanding your position in the world to understanding your own energy and to moving into a consciousness to love for yourself. I love, beautiful. I agree with you. <laughs> so we'll have a Facebook group. We will be able to jump in there, share your thoughts, share the tools, go and get Jennifer's free gift, do it. And then we would love to hear from you in the Facebook group. Did that, did that work? Did it help you? Do you have any questions? So Jennifer, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And uh, everybody, as I always say in my parting words, I remember to go out in the world, share your story, live your purpose, and be a blessing. Bye, folks.